Welcome everybody to another episode of Mind Right Game Tight. Mind Right Game Tight is interviews with current and former student athletes on all the experiences that they've had and they learned through through their experiences through sports and life and how they overcame it to inspire everyone who watches the show. My name is Michelle Morgan. I'm a transformational sports coach, so I work with student athletes on the empowering part of your mind as there's skill level coaches, there's strength and conditioning coaches, and for me I work on the mental aspect to bring it all together to reach your full potential in sports and in life. And you can learn more about me at vivasoro.com. Today our guest is Divya Biswal. She's from Ottawa, Canada. She graduated from St. Lawrence University in 2015 with a degree in biology with minors in math and chemistry. While at St. Lawrence, Divya was a 10-time Division III All-American in long jump and triple jump and a two-time national champion. She was also honored with being the USTFCCCA National Field Athlete of the Year twice. Divya now lives and trains in New York City, where she works as a hedge fund analyst. Her goal is to be the first Canadian triple jumper to represent Canada in the Olympics in 2020. So that's awesome stuff, Divya, already. You're amazing with everything I did said to intro you, uh-huh. so... I can't wait to learn more about you, but whether it be in sports or in life, there is adversity or a loss that can occur when we least expect it. And then when you and I first connected, you told me the story that I felt was so powerful about mm-hmm. a text message you received and a loss of a friend. And it happened on the day of competition, right? No, it happened on New Year's Day, but that was the year I was going to defend my NCAA title at home because we uh-huh. were in the championships. So. I don't know. It was definitely tough because that's like the last text you ever expect to get. And I've never dealt with loss like that before. And so I think it was a huge learning experience for me and my coaches had to help me get through it and my family. But there was a guy at my college named Garrett Gagne who played lacrosse and he, I remember was such a shy person. And so when we first started talking, like we had this connection and it was just he was just really easy to talk to and so our senior year i was in new york city for the first half of the semester and he always used to say he had sent me this text like i'm going to be at every single one of your track meets and i said oh no please don't come to ncaa's because our school was hosting it um and i said please don't come because track meets sometimes can be a little bit boring and it's not like a lacrosse game and he said on the day that he passed away I'm going to be at every single one of your track meets. You're not going to see me, but I'm going to be there watching you. And so I remember that when I realized that he had said those words and then the next morning I found out he passed away, I just, well, A, I felt chills, but B, those words kind of helped me get through that season. And because he was also on an athletic team at our school, like everywhere you go, you get reminded of people in the weirdest ways. And so I remember it was a really tough year and my coaches kept saying like, you have to get through it. You have to get through it. Just like get through one practice at a time. And so I remember like thinking every time I had a really tough workout that like, I just wanted to like be the best that I could be so that when NCAAs did come around, I didn't regret anything. And I didn't feel like I didn't put my all into it just because I was sad. And so I kind of channeled it and it was really funny because on the day of NCAAs, my coach, the lacrosse team had made these number one patches because his number was number one. And she Mm. brought me into her office right before the long jump final. And she ironed the patch on over like my heart of the Jersey. And that was like, I'll never forget that moment. And I won long jump, which I was not expected to do at all. Like (laughs) I'm not a long jumper by trade. I didn't end up winning triple jump, but his mom sent me a really nice message on the day of and she wished me luck and so it was a really great experience I definitely learned a lot from it and it's not something I ever wish on anyone but I think if anyone has to go through a situation like that you just have to remember that you have to be the best you can be every single day because it doesn't matter if you have a bad workout or if you're not feeling good if you just give it a hundred percent in that moment like you can't ask anything more of yourself so is that like the lesson that you took from it is like yeah. Being present in every moment and giving it your all at, at every any time, any part of the day, because you just never know. Yeah. And you just never want to live your life with regrets. And in my personal life, it also has made me 
like tell the people that I love that I love them or like not to just like hold everything in because like you would never want to experience something like that and not say what you had wanted to say to somebody. So like my boyfriend right now, like he gets so annoyed with me, but I tell him like, I love him all the time. <laughs> I'll just randomly say it. And I, I'm a worrier at times, but because of these situations, but it has definitely like made me appreciate everything that I have and like appreciate my track career. I get so upset talking about it, which is bad, but still, but it was, I, I learned a lot, especially about myself. Well, I thank you for sharing that story because when you first told me that story, I felt the power in that story and like I get emotional too. So like I'm feeling the emotions of just thinking of that, but not only that, just thinking of like how sometimes we take our days for granted, Mm -hmm. you know, and we don't think like, Oh, today's just like, whatever. It's not a great day, but it's like that moment that we can give like everything to knowing that no matter how you're feeling in that moment, you can change the next moment to give it your all to know that, you know, you're telling everybody that you love them or you forgive them or whether if it's in your sport or yeah. your friends, it's, it's being present, like having, hanging out with friends. Like I'm not just on social media all the time. That's part yeah. of it too. Yeah. So I thank you for sharing that because it is a powerful message for, yeah. for everyone to hear. So you attended St. Lawrence, which is a division three school. Mm-hmm. You guys compete division three in track and field. Cause I did see where they compete division yeah. one in hockey. So did you feel like there was any stigmas attached to being a division three athlete? Because, yeah. you know, everyone's goal is like, I want to play division one. I, I want to reach division one. So was there any stigmas yeah. attached to the division three? There definitely are a lot of stigmas. And I even like, I suffered from it a lot. I would go to meets like Penn Relays and I'd be in the invitational section against all of these girls from LSU or uh, Penn State or any of these big division one schools. And we had a coach at St. Lawrence who was a division one NCAA champion in the, in the disc, in the discus or the hammer. I forget. She's going to kill me for not knowing (laughs) for forgetting, but she had to sit me down one year at Penn relays because I was so nervous. And I remember I was crying in the stands before I had to go jump because I said, I don't belong out there with all those girls. And she said to me, she's like, you you deserve to be there just as much as they do. You're just not getting paid to do your event, but you're getting a great education and you're at the same meets that they're at. The really only big difference is you don't get to go, you don't get to compete against division one athletes at NCAAs or within the conference, but all those big invitational meets, there are so many division three athletes who are just as good or better than the best division one NCAA athletes. And so I think it is really tough, but you just have to, believe in your own abilities and just remember that everyone goes down a different path because for example like Nick Simmons was the division three NCAA champion and he's one of the best 800 meter runners I mean he created run gum look at him go he came from a division three school and he didn't give he didn't care at all and so I've definitely had to have more confidence and even now when people say oh what school did you go to I say, oh, St. Lawrence is a Division three school, but, and I, I get so mad at myself for saying that because you should never be ashamed of where you came from because the opportunities I got from going to a Division three school, I wouldn't have gotten at another school. And so everything happens for a reason. And the job I have today is I got because of the connections I made at my school. And that would have never allowed me to find my new trouble zone coach in New York if I would have never moved there. So like everything happens for a reason. And I would have never, I would have experienced success within division one, but I I don't think I would have won all of these awards for field athlete of the year. And that's something that you can be proud of because even within division three, it's really tough to win these awards. And so it kind of helps you grow confidence, but it is something that I struggled with because I'm super competitive. competitive. (laughs) And so a lot of Canadians, especially when I went to school in the U.S., didn't go to Division One schools because there was this stigma that Canadians go to D1 schools and they break because our training styles are very different within Canada and the U.S. And so I didn't go there. And then now and now more Canadians are going and they're doing great. And like, I'm so proud of that. But it was just a choice that I went to my school for the school also, not just track it led me to where I am today. And so I'm very thankful for that, but it was something I had to overcome. Yeah, I agree. I think we forget a lot of the times that there's circumstances and there's all these other things that play a role in depending on what school you go to. So like, even like when you mentioned, like I went to St. Lawrence, it's a division three, but 
you know, I went to a Division two school, but I always say, like, I loved it. You know, yeah. like, I went to San Francisco State University. I'm like, it's a city that people all over the world want to go yeah. travel to. And so it's the experiences that you get from, you know, whatever school that you go to and the networking and the connections that you make and the friendships and all those different things that are, you know, going to be really important for you yeah. in life as well. And then look at, I mean, right now you're, you're with the Canadian team. I know. So, I think a big part of competing Division Three though, is that I, not a lot, but I'd say 50% of Division One athletes they kind of lose their passion for the sport by the end of their four years because it's like a job. And I would love that. Even now, I would love for track to be my only job, but it definitely made me not fall out of love with the sport. And I kind of took a bit of time off after I graduated and then decided that this is what I really want to go for. And so I am thankful that I didn't kind of lose my love for track and field while being a Division three athlete. Yeah, I think it's it's great. And I mean, look where you're at now. And, you know, Olympics. That's Hopefully. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. So yeah. when I when we hear when I hear the term track and field athlete, I usually think of someone who's like in tip top shape condition. Yeah. Um, did you ever have, you know, any times where you compare yourself, your physique to other athletes as a track and field athlete? Funny that you say this. Because, you know, on Facebook, when the memories pop up, like it says, oh, yeah. oh, your memory from five years ago. So I have a twin sister who who's also a hurdler for, she's made some international teams with me. And we always send each other screenshots of like from five years ago. And we did not look how we do now. And it is tough because there is this stigma that track athletes have to be super ripped. And you see all these pictures of people with six packs or eight packs. And that's just... I mean, it's great if you have it, but not everyone's body type is like that. And I've learned that my body type is even different than my twin sisters. And so she is able to shed fat really quickly, especially around her stomach, whereas I can't shed it that quickly around my stomach. And so it's tough because you're competing in these basically bikinis and you're running uh -huh. down the runway jumping and <laughs> you want to feel confident in yourself. But at the same time, like one of my coaches, who is also my boyfriend, he has to sit me down a lot and say, there isn't one body type for every event or every athlete. Like you can do anything with any body type. As long as you're strong and you have the tools and you train hard, you will find success. Like granted, you can't be 20 pounds overweight if you're a triple jumper because you want to be as lean as possible, but you don't have to look like you have an eight pack and <laughs> super jacked. Like as long as you are confident in yourself, it will go a lot further than just being skinny because I find that when I believe in myself and when I'm confident in all the training I've done, it doesn't matter how I look like I'm going to jump far. And so that was tough though, because in college I, I was around a lot of distance runners who had eating disorders. And I feel like a lot of the time people associate success with being skinny or being fit. And that's just not the case. Like for example, there's a Canadian heptathlete she retired who got a medal at the olympics and is one of the world's best heptathletes and she didn't have the body type of what you would consider a heptathlete to have but she was a world-class athlete and she did it in her own way with her own body and she owned it and i think that's really inspiring for people because it's it's really sad to me when people just don't believe in themselves and it's funny that i say this because i struggle with this myself and i'm working on it but Believing in yourself and being confident in your abilities and your body and what you're capable of is literally like 70% of competing well. I would say mm. it, it's more than the physical because you can be the most prepared person ever. And I've done this. And then you go into a meet and you freak out because you're not confident in yourself and you won't run fast or you won't jump far because you don't think you can. So it doesn't matter what anyone else says. You really just have to be your biggest fan. Like it sounds so self-centered and so you sound so stuck up but you really just have to love yourself <laughs> <laughs> there are girls who have no business running the times that they run but they do it because they literally just believe in themselves so much yeah uh, like I am trying to be more like that in my life because I think it's good to love yourself I agree so how are you how are you working on that since I know that might be you know, yeah. something that you're working on. So how, what are the things that you're doing to working on believing in yourself more? Trying to consciously make all the right 
anything that I have control over, I'm trying to do it to the best of my ability. So whether it's my diet or if it's drinking on weekends, like I've realized in life that there's very little you actually have control over. And so the only way for me myself to be confident in me is every decision that I can consciously make or I have control over. I try to do what I think is right for the future and then I can feel confident in what I've done because I'm the biggest worrier about everything, which is horrible. My coaches are always like, you can only control like what's in your ability. You can't control what somebody else does. So I just try to make the best choices for myself. And the biggest thing I've learned though with being an athlete is, and this is how I decided to be more confident in myself is you have to be happy for other athletes. Like when other athletes perform well, you have to feel happy for them because they worked really hard too. And if you're unhappy because they did well and you didn't, well, there's no point wasting that negative energy in somebody else. Like put it into positive energy into yourself so that you can be the best that you can be. And then they'll, whether they're happy for you or not one day, you will end up better as a person for it. And that's like another lesson I learned in college is that if you can just be happy for your competitors or for your teammates, like regardless of if you get the attention or not, you will be a much better off person. And that was something that really helped transform my track abilities by senior year was that I was just so happy for everyone else when they did well. And I was happy for myself that I did well, that I spent a lot less time focused on negative things. And it just made me a happier person. But it's tough. Yeah. It's not <laughs> But you're living proof of that because you said like you changed that mindset and then like look what happened like your last two years of college, you're an NCAA champion two years in a row. So I mean, that's awesome. But is there a story that you can share where you did doubt yourself or you had a lot of worry and then you really dug deep and then you showed yourself that, you know, you do believe in yourself and you showed yourself what that really meant and you stood for believing in yourself. So this year at nationals canadian nationals i had had a really good season all year i'd been pb getting personal best every single meet and then i go to nationals and i foul five out of six jumps in long jump and came fourth in long jump when all my fouls were good enough to come first or second and it was it killed me on the inside and it was a rainy day we were outside for three hours waiting for the storm to pass like it was just the worst set up for any event and then I go and foul five out of six jumps so I'm like great so then I go into triple jump the next day and I'm my muscles hurt I'm exhausted I'm tired and my first three jumps were not very good (laughs) I then I remember watching my sister make the hurdle final she like I was triple jumping I look up on the big screen she's running her prelim she makes the final like runs the season's best I remember crying of happiness because I just felt so happy for her because I know how (laughs) And then I thought to myself, Divya, you really can't screw this up. So because a lot of this was being decided on who would make the international teams for the year also. And just meddling at nationals is a big deal. Like everybody wants to win a medal. Mm-hmm. So it's not like the NCAA where eight people get a medal. It's just top three. So it like eliminates five spots. So you really got to be on your game. And I remember just thinking to myself, you have to have fun with this and you have to remember why you love doing this. And then on my last jump, my I fouled the next jump, which was really good. I jumped an okay one for the fifth, and then my last jump was good enough to get me into third place. And I've never been so proud of myself because normally when I have a bad meet like that, there's no getting out of it. And that's something that my coach and I have worked really hard on is mindset and forgetting a bad jump and moving on to the next one. And I think watching my twin sister qualify for the final because hurdles in Canada is extremely competitive. So making the national final in hurdles is a huge deal. So I think watching her like achieve success helped me believe in myself and just get it together. So that it was awesome. That's I great. Like- and that goes back to you taking like that positive energy from someone else's success and bringing it to yourself again. So, and then knowing that you guys are twins, you guys compete in track and field. So you guys are getting compared a lot. Um, How has that impacted you? And then how did you guys get to that place where you're like happy and, you know, happy for each other's success? When we split up for college, that definitely played a role because we weren't around each other 24 seven. 
it's really tough to be around somebody 24 or something. Um, and even now, if we spend too much time around each other, we can sometimes get on each other's nerves. But she had a really tough year her first year, and she was really supportive of me. And I think that really helped me become confident in myself. And then as she became more confident in herself, like we kind of fed off of each other's success. And so now we're at this place where we want to make these teams together and we want to do it as twins and we want to go to the Olympics. And it's way easier, like I said earlier, to just have positive energy and be happy for people than to like waste your time being upset. And she's my twin. So when she's successful, I view that as we're both successful and I think she looks at it the same way so you kind of get double the success <laughs> <laughs> I like that well we're looking forward to that as well and seeing that happen and then like also just like how do you guys like or how did you get over caring what other people think you know like if I'm comparing you to your yeah. sister you know it's like did that impact you on like this is what somebody thinks about me it did when we were younger. And then I finally, one day, I forget, I don't even fully remember how I came to this realization, but I think, I think it's because, so you see these people on Instagram who are really successful. They have a really big following or whatever. And you see all these people who start talking bad about them. Or back when I was younger, it was YouTube. Like YouTube was a big thing. Like people had YouTube channels and it was the greatest thing ever. And I remember kids in our high school used to like make fun of my sister and I for having a YouTube channel. But then I thought to myself, you see all these people do what they love and they don't care what anyone else thinks and look at how successful they are. And if people are judging you, it's because they're jealous of you. And if they're going to waste their time being bothered by something that you're doing that doesn't affect them at all, like there's literally no point in wasting your energy on them because it just doesn't matter. Like all it's doing is making you focus on something that isn't even true if they just because they think it doesn't make it doesn't make it true and so but that takes a long time to be able to just not care what people think about you because if you look at anyone who's successful at anything there's probably like 70 percent of people who don't like them just because they wish that they were them or they're just jealous that they don't have that opportunity but if you just focus on yourself and find your own opportunity in your own little area like everyone can be successful you just it's, it's just so pointless. And so my sister and I, we just stopped caring because caring just does you no good. And if they're not going to be supportive of you, then there's no point for them to be in your life. Like at all. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. So, you're right. Thank you. Dropping wisdom know. and knowledge today. Um, <laughs> because my boyfriend can probably hear this right now and he's going to later we're going to be at practice and I'm going to be a men- mental nutcase and he's going to be like, where's all this? <laughs> you're going to have to have this on your playlist. So you're like, whenever you're warming up and you're just listening to yourself or myself and be like, you said those words. So you should look <laughs> That's right. So um, what is it that, what are your goals that's coming up? Like, what is it that you're up to right now? Um, so one of my big goals is, Canada's hosting the NACAC championships, which are in August, and it's basically North America, South America, and the Caribbean, and it's going to be held in Toronto, and so one of my big goals this year is to win nationals, because there's there's two other Canadian triple jumpers who are really awesome jumpers. Well, there's a bunch of awesome Canadian triple jumpers, but basically the goal is to hopefully jump high 13s, 14 meters, I think in feet, that's like 45 and a half, 14 meters. Um, I'm currently at 1327. I, I can feel it there. So those are my goals to, to jump further, but to win nationals and to get to represent Canada at NACAC when we're hosting would be really awesome. And there's also world indoors this year, which is in March. That's, that's a stretch, but I think you should always set big goals for yourself because you'll reach them one day. And so Canada has never sent a female triple jumper to the Olympics in the entirety of the country's history. Wow. So I know that the other two jumpers and I, that's a big goal of ours because each country can send three athletes. And so in Canada, if you can jump the standard for the Olympics, you'll go. And so that's a big goal for, I think, all of Canadian triple jumps. So just got to get to it first. Wow. That's awesome. Well, keep it up. And I know I sometimes – Hear the little bit of doubt, but 
listen to this. You've already shown what a great athlete you are in your mind so that you can really achieve anything that you put your mind to. So continuously remember that. And I'm already going to say I look forward to seeing you in 2020. Um, are there any social media sites that we can follow you on to keep updated on your journey? Yes. So I have a personal Instagram, which is Divya Biswal. And then my twin and I have a, an Instagram called Biswal Squared, which is our Twinstagram. And it basically shows our different lives and how we're trying <laughs> to achieve the same goal, but we're doing it in different ways. Got it. So I'll make sure I have those links in the bio for the YouTube video. And then I want to thank you for being on the show. I know you got to go train soon, actually, right now. So thank you so much, Divya, because you shared so much knowledge. You shared so much your personal life. Things that a lot of us think about, but maybe we don't hear about, you know, yeah. out there in the media. So that's really important. And once again, girl, you got it. Thank you for having <laughs> me on your show. <laughs> and then one last thing before you go, you just have to finish this sentence. I am grateful for my sister. Aww. <laughs> I love her. <laughs> the best. Awesome. That's thank sweet. You. Well, thank, thank you, Divya, for being on. Um, good luck with this year going on with all the meets and being there to represent Canada. They're in Canada for the nationals and all that great yeah. stuff. So we look forward to hearing more about all your success. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. You too.